Um, I am excited to bring you this, uh, this message, the rocks cry out young earth. Um, I know that when I attended college, graduate school, if I said I was a young earth creationist, I would be ostracized. Um, especially if I said that I believe in 6,000 years. They call me a crazy fundamentalist. So today's seminar is to get rid of this myth, this myth that you have to have deep time. And so the rocks cry out young earth. And that's what we're going to uh, focus on today. And as we get started, we're going to be talking about some very important things. So um, we've been doing a series exposing the great myths of evolution. And that series is to show the fallacies of evolution. And we wanna make it simple. We, it's kind of a teaching mechanism for those who participate us online and in here. We wanna, we wanna have a teaching mechanism where you can kind of like a, a key holder that you have in your house and you just put the key on it, you know? So you have something to you know, share your faith with. These uh, sessions or these ideas get complicated. So we break them up into very maybe three different components and explain those components. That's what it's all about. So as Christians, we can share our faith and we can share our faith confidently. So the, that's the idea of the myths, the great myths of evolution series. Tonight, we're gonna, do, we're gonna explain this myth. What story do rocks tell us? Do they speak of evidence of Noah's flood? So that's the thing we're gonna be talking about. Now, the myth that we're gonna cover is a myth and the myth is this, the rocks give evidence of deep time. Now, that's what's taught to us in our schools throughout, even in Christian schools. Many of them have kind of fallen into this trap of old age. And so I know that this is a fact. Um, and, and, and so it's kind of a wrestling point, even with Christians, because they want to hold on to this idea of old earth. So let's go through this. We're going to, we're going to tackle this myth three different ways. One, Ge geological history representing deep time is based on, listen to this, evolutionary bias. So that's bias. What, what bias? We'll go into that. It's very important to understand that there's bias here. Uh, the basic point is that nobody was there, you see. Nobody was there to, I mean, we find a rock, does a rock have a date in it to say, well, I was made this date, like you would find maybe in a grocery store where you pick up a, a, and it says, well, it's going to expire this date. You kind of know when, you know, here we have no idea. So we're going to expose the bias. The rock record is incomplete and not continuous. And I, I think we have a great example here in the United States. We're going to look at the Grand Canyon and just use that as an example. There are many other examples, but I thought this one is very specific and we could share that with you. And lastly, this is going to be a tough, tough topic, but we're going to do it because I get asked many questions about this. How about radiometric dating? Well, radiometric dating depends on evolutionary presuppositions. So when they say, well, I know this rock is millions of years old because it's been radiometric dated. It's been dated. And you look at that word radiometric dated and you kind of fall in your tracks and say, wow, that's a big word. I, I guess it must be true. No, we're gonna take a look at that and make sure we understand the process. So the first thing we're gonna do is take a look at the first myth, uh, the myth, uh, and then we're going to take a look at the first tool. So here's point one. Geological history representing deep time is based on evolutionary bias. That's the first kind of uh, hook we're going to put our key on. Okay, so that's the first point. All right, so let's take a look. How is bias? Well, I thought that we start with the beginning of time. Beginning of time. And well, what people thought of and the beginning of geology and how that kind of came to be. Before Darwin was born, most people in England accepted certain ideas about natural world as given. Species were not linked in a single family tree. They were unconnected, unrelated, unchanged since the moment of their creation. And Earth itself was thought to be so young, perhaps only 6,000 years. Now, I took a picture of this. I took a picture of this because I attended in 2006 the Darwin Exposition celebrating his birthday and also celebrating his 150th 100th uh, 150th year birthday and 100 years of his publication. Uh, so uh, I think it was 200. No, yeah, but anyway, it was around 150 years. Anyway, the bottom line is, is that they were having a birthday party for Charles Darwin in this museum. But it was very serious. I felt like I was attending 
a service, a, a service, a religious service where many people were worshiping. I, actually, when I went through the exhibit, I asked the docent, how long will it take? She never answered my question. She told me that if you go through this exhibit and read every word, it will change your life. Then I realized I was in a religious service. So let's just take the look at the history of geology and how this all came to be. So I'm not sure if you're aware of one of the great men, theologians, the London Church Fathers, Origen of Alexandria. Well, yeah, he, he, he was an early Christian scholar and theologian, very early, as you can see, 184 to 253 AD. He has been recognized as one of the greatest geniuses of, earth, of the early church ever produced. Then we look and we say that Origen wrote that the creation was young in 6,000 years range, even though he held more of a symbolic view of the days of creation of Genesis. So even though he kind of symbolized these days and uh, we look at them and he looked at them as 6,000 years old. Now, there are other famous um, theologians that came along. We have Luther and we have Calvin. Luther came from Germany, Calvin came from France, both maintain a young earth model. They believed in 6,000 years. They believed in literal days and that's important to understand. Now, you know, we looked at this and we heard about it. And, 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 and of course, when they read the scriptures, um, there is uh, a ancestry that's in the Bible. The ancestry tells us who lived what and, and when they died. And, you know, it was, if you read chapter five, five, you see it literally in Genesis. And you get an idea that there is an ancestry that we can follow. And Bishop Usher did that. He followed every bit. He did, he did a complete study in 1651. He wrote the Annals of the World and it was rigorous. Uh, uh, James Usher, Anglican Archbishop of Aramea Island, he published this book, Annals of the World, and, and it was very well described. We actually have a copy of this in our museum, and we also have the map. Now, of course, today it was met with criticism, and one of the biggest criticizers was Jay Gould, J. Stephen Gould. Now, Jay, Jay has passed away. He, uh, he 2002, he passed away. He had uh, died very young, but he was famous for his punctuated equilibrium. If you take a look, I'm going to use my pointer and show you this was the old way of looking at evolution, it was the tree of life. Jay Gould, Stephen Jay Gould, said that life was punctuated, it was made of these kind of quick punctuations, and he called that abrupt appearance. All of a sudden, abruptly was formed. And he had to connect the lines, but creations don't collect the lines because these lines, are, we don't have the transitions that go inside these lines when we look at the fossil record. He just said all of a sudden, boom, they came to be. But this is what he said about Bishop Usher. There's probably no name more indelibly linked with a rigid church fundamentally, fundamentalism than that of Bishop James Usher who today is almost exclusively known as the man who fixed the time of creation at midday on October 23rd, 4004 BC. Of course, he was ridiculing, uh, he, was, he was ridiculing Bishop Usher. So you kind of see that wherever we, we talk about 6,000 years, we're gonna be ridiculed for what we believe in. Now, it's interesting when we observe this, that when I teach, here at Southern Florida Bible College, um, I have the opportunity to share this, this man, Nicholas Steno, in 1836 and 18, uh, 1686. You can see a bishop hat because he, he went into religious studies and he left geology and, and worked as a bishop in, in the Catholic Church. We're shortly after Usher's writings that one of the most influential early geologists, Nicholas Steno, would lay the groundwork for modern geology. Now, I don't know if many people know this, but Steno laid down the work and he used the flood as a model. He said Steno also produced the first detailed geological history of any region in the world. 
He studied the rocks and he was convinced by looking at the rocks that we had a worldwide flood. Creation Week and Noah's flood were responsible for the formation of many rock layers and that the retreating floodwaters also called their final erosion. So there's a thing in geology which we call erosion. When, when all of a sudden the rock layers start to disappear and you could see in this diagram here from my Earth, uh, studies, uh, Earth Studies book, it says the heavens and the earth, that's the book we work out of. You can see here how literally the, the rocks start to form. They, they form these layers because some are missing. And he explained that in his dissertation Pro in 1669. He brilliantly gave us a foundation for geological stratification that is known today as Stano's Law of Superposition. And so what is this superposition? Well, he gave us the idea that erosion took place and he blamed it on the flood. Stano was the first scientist to produce such a comprehensive geological history for any area of the world. And his approach was firmly rooted in the biblical concept, ready for this, of 6,000 years and a global flood. Now I come to you today and said, that's my conclusion. And you're gonna see why as we go through this. Now, in geology, we started off with water. Water was the producer of geology. You could see Stano was talking about water. Water would cause erosion, it was caused by the flood. Well, Woodward also believed in that, another famous geologist from England. So he supported the fact that the flood containing one common mass of sediments that would eventually be settled out in the heavier particles and fossils would settle down. That's what we see in the Grand Canyon. Now I'll explain that, but he gave us an idea that water was going to be the force, the idea of a flood to be a force that's going to make the rock layers of what we see today. Now, of course, when we talk about force and we talk about rock layers, we talk about life also. And that's where fossils come in. So John Woodward collected fossils. He had a big collection of fossils and he there was a college established by it. I'm not sure it was Cambridge or I'm not sure it was uh, uh, Cambridge or uh, Oxford. So one of those colleges was founded on his idea of fossils and geology was starting to take hold. Now a very interesting person along with this history I must mention, and there are others, I'm just giving you a brief history, was um, uh, catastrophism. Catastrophism was the idea of looking at geology and looking how the flood caused these layers. Early geologists held to young earth views, but in the late 1700s, old earth views began to take hold of catastrophism. What is catastrophism? Well, catastrophism is when we have sudden appearance of of rocks being moved, like you know, we say catastrophe. That's what we're talking about. Tremendous power moving lots of rocks. And so this is how Sagewick and also others uh, introduced this kind of idea. So this was during Darwin's time. Actually, Adam Sedgwick was Darwin's geology teacher when he went to Christ Church in Cambridge. And uh, Darwin had a lot of admiration for Adam Sedgwick because he knew his rocks. And if you read Darwin's account of the origin of, uh, before he wrote The Origin of Species, he wrote about the beagle and all his adventures in the beagle. 70% of his writings were on geology. And Sedgwick was kind of, the, he influenced Darwin in his writings. Attempts to harmonize the Bible with old earth views related to day age gap theory, which were developed in the early 1800s. So they kind of got away from the 6,000 years. There was a compromise here. And they compromised said, okay, we have these different layers and these different layers are caused because the fossils that we see have appeared here and they appear now next layer and they appear the next layer. And so um, they didn't account for the idea of erosion and so on. And so they started this idea of catastrophism. Many of the leading geologists of early 1800s were catastrophists, including William Buckland. Okay, William Buckland was from Oxford. Uh, Adam Sedgwick was from Cambridge. And then we had George Cuvier, uh, who was from France. Adam Sedgwick was one of Darwin's mentors. So he, right here, Adam Sedgwick was one of Darwin's mentors, as I mentioned earlier. So when Darwin went out, 
He believed that the earth was not millions of years, we believe today, but thousands upon thousands. He will already compromise 6,000 years because he was taught by, by Sedgwick and others that the earth was old, old in their comparison. Now we see that as we look at this, we see a very important figure. I want to spend time with him. His name is James Hutton, 1726 to 1797. James Hutton established a very important concept. He believed that fire was a primary agent, not water to build rock levels. Now remember, I told you before that water was a first, first way of looking at geology. But now Hutton is emphasizing it's got to be fire. It's got to be volcanoes. It's got to be exploding. It's got to be, that's how everything came to be, okay? So we get a change, a new idea. Rocks were divided into categories. He said there's going to be volcanoes and they're going to cause a lot of explosions and that's where the rocks are born, okay? But the rocks go through a process and water is the processor. So he said there's water, but there's volcanoes. Volcanoes have to come first. It was fire, you understand? Fire was the main agent to cause the rocks. Now, I don't want to bore you on geology, but I want to just follow how we had this kind of idea of 6,000 years, and then it started to get compromised. The catastrophe was the first one to compromise. Now he comes in and he boldly proclaims that it's not water, it's volcanoes. Now, many of you might not, well, many of you might know this, you studied geology, I don't know if you studied earth science, but the idea is that rocks perpetuate themselves. They cycle around. So the volcanoes spit up the rocks, the rocks get turned around on the earth, the ocean carries them, water carries them, whatever carries them, and they get turned back, they go back into the earth again, and through other processes like, like pressure and so on, they turn, they actually turn into a new thing, like diamonds and and so on, uh, slate, they turn into things that are, are you know, I'm, I call them amazing because, you, I mean, when you think about how a rock can change from, from let's say, um, in Florida, we have a lot of limestone and it's kind of white. And all of a sudden you get this beautiful slate. You, that's kind of a neat thing. Now, I also got to mention diamonds. Diamonds are another part of this special thing. So the, the, Hudson said, hey, I mean, Hutton said, we got to move this. This is kind of a million and millions of years ever going process, process and process that continues and continues. And then he threw this little thing in, which is very important. He said this, he said he did research in Edinburgh and published the theory of earth in 1795. Every rock's history could be only explained in the present. This is defined as uniformitarianism. Now, what did I just say? He looks at the rock and says, okay, this rock came here because if I look at what's around us, these processes, like I mentioned erosion, like wind, water, and so on, were responsible for these rocks to be made. But here's the thing, it had to take millions and millions of years. You get the idea? Now we throw everything out. We throw God's word out and we now say it's taking millions and millions of years to process. It's a very, very slow, slow way of doing things. And we see this, look at fire, primary agent to build the rock layers, according to James Hutton. We see that volcanoes are his big study, but he also finds study in this beautiful part of Scotland, in the British Isles this rock formation became important. He studies that the fundamental force of recycle rocks, as we study volcanic eruptions, he looks at rocks at this sicker point. And what is sicker point? Sicker point is a point where he develops his theory, which I just mentioned, uniformitarianism. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see these rock layers, you see them? Now there are rock layers going up and there's rock layers going on the side, you see that? That's not hard to see. See that? We're, there's something here. There's a line. Okay. Something happened. So let's see how Hutton explains this. So this is at Berk, uh, Berkwickshire, the east coast of Scotland. He came from Scotland. So this is an international site, what you see right now. If you went there, you can see it with your own eyes. At least 65 million years are missing. Remember I told you when you come over here, go up and over here, Hutton said there's 
millions of years missing. Where did they go? He said, so a geological history when he, the vertical rocks pointing upward made of sandstone and mudstone met with a capstone, gray wacky, the horizontal layer deposited by the ocean. So he throws the ocean in here. He says, well, tectonic action, you know, we had tectonics, the plates were moving, push this rock up, and then we had layering of rock on top of it. That's called sediment. They're all sedimentary rock. But when you date them, the lower rock layer is older than the top rock layer. And it's a lot, uh, there's a big difference, 65 million years difference over there, 65 million years of difference. So that's what they call unconformity. Okay, that's going to be something we discuss. In other words, we're missing years. So how did how did um, James Hutton describe this? Well, he kind of said, well, I believe that the rocks hit and we have lots of erosion. And then the ocean came in, flooded the area and left a deposit behind. And that's the capstone. Now let's think about that. Was he there to observe it? He had an idea that there was capstones, but this is what geology is. And I need to explain this. This is where bias is built. A friend of mine who, was, who majored in geology from Princeton University told me, he said, when I was taking these courses, geologists would come up here and explain everything. And they were done in such fluid, uh, they were fluid in their explanation. He, he said, it was just great. And just listening to them. Then when he became a Christian and started to realize what was going on, he said he found out that he found that it was just like a winsome story. It's just like they could tell a story about how this happened. I mean, how do we know what happened? See, that's where the bias comes in. And I want people to understand that. So you look at this and you see these rocks and you see, well, what happened in the 65 million years? That's called, that point is called Hutton's unconformity. And the way they explain it is that it's just a marvel. He, they say he's just a, he's a brain. He's, he, he's a genius in his way because he, he was able to look at this rock and say that there's missing rock. And I believe this is because of erosion. And I believe this rock was laid on top of it. So a lot of us would look at that and say, wait a minute, how do you know? How do you know? Are there other rock layers in the area like this? How do you know? So, Jean Baptiste Lamarck, Jean Baptiste Lamarck in 1809, a French biologist. Now, Charles Darwin developed the theory, or he basically publicized the theory, made it very popular. But Jean Baptiste Lamarck was the first one. I'm going to tell you, Charles Darwin did, I don't want to throw him, throw, he did make a theory, okay? And it was a theory that was workable. I don't believe in it, but it was a theory that, you know, he tried to work through. This John Matisse Lamarck became before Darwin, and this really was the first theory. But I found this interesting because in the zoological philosophy of exposition with regard to the natural history of animals in his book, he, he was an excellent paleontologist. He did plants, he did invertebrates, everything. He's genius in his time. And this is what he says. Oh, how very ancient the earth is and how ridiculously small the ideas of those who consider the earth to be 6,000 years old. He wrote this in 1809. So how ridiculous I am to believe that the earth is 6,000 years old. This antiquity will appear even greater when he realizes the length of time and the particular conditions which were necessary to bring all living species into existence. So, you know, I think he was religiously inspired when he wrote those words. But you notice something. I have something missing. Let me fill that blank. Let me fill that area up. So I went to the Chicago Field Museum and I had a chance to see John Baptiste, uh, Jean Baptiste Lamarck's theory written on a column. I didn't know it was written by him, I knew about his theory. But didn't understand, didn't, you know, when I saw this, I just took a picture of it. I thought it was, was a statement that meant a religious statement. It was on the Field Museum in a big, I still remember, a green column. And there it was. It was, it, it was a marble posted there. Time is unimportant, never difficult for nature. 
It is always at her disposal and represents an unlimited power in which she accomplishes the greatest and smallest task. Think about that. Time is unimportant, never difficult for nature. So nature has time on its side. See, nature can do lots of things with time. Now think, that's how evolution starts with time. You don't see evolution take place, do you? None of us do. But the secret is time, you see. It always at her disposal represents unlimited power. That reminds me of God. God has unlimited power, not time, in which accomplishes the greatest task, a greatest and smallest tasks. Many today believe in this concept. Many believe in what we call naturalism. And they're teaching our kids all about where we come from and where we believe, and they're writing the textbooks. And that's a philosophy. It's This is not science, it's a philosophy. You see, when you say that nature has unlimited power, time has unlimited power, it tells me that's a philosophy, it's a worldview. And we look, and we look at the, I love the idea of looking at this uh, giraffe, the idea of giraffe and his long left, where Marxism evolution requires deep time and special conditions. See, Lamarck believed that you had to have special conditions, and with those right conditions, that that net can grow. He believed that or, organism, organisms would change, evolve over time as they adapt to the environmental conditions for survival. For example, the snake would evolve legs, and become a lizard, and the llama's, the llama's neck would grow and become, stretch it out, and eventually be changing into the modern day giraffe. He called these changes acquired characteristics. That was one of his ideas. The other idea is that nature would always work upwards. In other words, it had, an, uh, it had its own instinctive way of, of finding itself and moving upwards. This is philosophy, ladies and gentlemen. Please understand this. It's like going to religious class and learning about things. And that's what they believed in. And that's what they're believed today in evolution. And they're teaching our kids this philosophy. Okay, James Hutton, the founder of uniformitarianism, passed on this torch to his follower, Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell popularizes uniformitarianism. It was dying for a while. Catastrophes were running all over it. But all of a sudden, Charles Lyell came into play he was a friend of Charles Darwin. Both Charles, Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin were really close. Uniform terrorism then quickly dominated geological thinking, which it is today. Uniformitarianism simply said is this, the present is the key to the past. Can you remember that? The present is the key to the past. It has dominated geological thinking since the middle 1800s. And the idea is that when we look at rocks, they are very old. They've been processed by processes we see today. And it took lots and lots of time with slow, slow, minute changes to make the rock the way it is. Exactly like evolution. It parallels the thinking of evolution. So when Jean Baptiste Lamarck was looking at his theory, deep time was essential for that theory to hold any, any support. They needed deep time. Deep time is the, is the religion of evolution. Now we go a little further and we see that Charles Lyell's influence is amazing. He, uh, he influenced Charles Lyell's principles with three volumes. He had three volumes of principles in geology. Those books, yes, Charles Lyell's influence is amazing, but it was his books that <laughs> influenced everybody. It's been called the most important scientific book ever written, right next to Charles Darwin, Origin of Species. I don't know if you know this, but that was very important. The first copy was given to Charles Darwin when he went on the Beagle. That's the exploratory um, voyage he did for five years. In his last year of college, he graduated, and that was his trip. He went around the world and picked up fossils. With Lyle's book, he was able to think of millions and millions of years, always think of a deep time. Published in 1830, shook prevailing views of how Earth had been formed. Charles Darwin went on his, went on his voyage in 1831. He just graduated college in 1831. He goes on the, the Beagle with the first edition of Charles Lyle's book. 
Uh, his book was an attack on a common belief among geologists and other creationists that the unique character catastrophes or supernatural events such as Noah's flood shaped Earth's surface. According to this view, a once tumultuous, tumultuous period of change had slowed to today's calmer and more leisurely pace. So we had to have this tumultuous kind of event and then eventually slow down, slow down, slow down. That's the picture of deep time, slow, slow process, taking millions of years. So see that fairy? That's the pixie dust. That's the pixie dust of deep time. That pixie dust gave Charles Darwin the influence with the tree of life. That tree didn't come all of a sudden. His tree of life took millions of years to develop. Remember, from the small to the complex, from the small to the complex. That was the idea of that, okay? So we get this idea that we're talking about no deep time. Without, deep, without no deep time, you have no tree of life. Understand that? Because I'm a creationist and I believe in 6,000 years, there's no way evolution can exist. The pixie dust, the pixie dust is the way, the magic wand for evolutionists, okay? It's called nature's deep time. Do you understand the bias? I, I, think, I'm, I think you could see it because what we're, what we're doing is, the, you know, it's like the princess and the frog, right? The, what's the magic kiss, okay? Evolution's magic kiss is what? Deep time. You see that? So keep that in mind because that's exactly what we're talking about. So I went to school and I learned about millions of years. Every time I open a book, I hear millions of years. Every time I go to a lecture in earth science, I hear millions of years. Every time I turn the Discovery Channel, I hear millions of years. I think we call this kind of thing called brainwashing. You, you, you agree? I mean, there's something going on when they say the same thing over and over again. Actually, um, if you're in science classes and you don't you don't believe in deep time uh, and you don't believe in the evolution, you're not scientific. I know this. Well, I was mocked many times because of this. So this leads us to two questions. First question is, did the Big Bang cause all the rocks. Do the, all the earth rocks originate from a big bang as products of slow change due to natural process over long periods of time? That's the, that's the argument. That is the deep-seated argument. Next thing is this. We look in terms and we see that, or do these rocks tell a very different story about earth where the basement rocks were formed by divine creator in the very beginning and that's subjected to, to worldwide catastrophic catastrophic forces caused by the Genesis flood. That's what I propose to you today. See, that to me is logical. What's logic? That the creator who is all powerful can put all the stars in, all over the, the universe can also create an earth full of unbelievable complexity, set it in motion, and he was the one that put everything together. So we look at rocks, and the first thing we see on the bottom of everything, and I'll get into it next point, bottom of everything is, if I went down deep, 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 dig it up, dig, drill it down, drill deep, deep, where would you go? You're gonna hit metamorphic rock, or you're gonna hit igneous rock. They're the basement rocks, no matter where you go. I believe that's what God created. He started off with the beginning. He's the one that got the first volcanoes going. He's the one that set the metamorphic rocks in place. And that's what we see when we look at the world around us. Okay, let's take a breath. So we got one key done, the bias. Think about some of those points, the bias. The bias is brought to us. The fact that it's just kind of a story they tell us, okay? It's kind of a story because there's a lot of missing things. Nobody was there to see it. Okay, second thing, we're gonna have to. The rock record is incomplete and non-continuous. So if the earth is very, very old, we should see a rock layers that are continuous. 
You follow me? So let's see what we see. And I thought the first trip, and that's the only trip I'm going to take with you tonight, is the rock record is incomplete. And I'm, what do you see right in front of your eyes? The Grand Canyon. I've been there. It's a beautiful place. I've been on the top and I've been on the bottom. Okay. You want to see God's glory, go to the Grand Canyon. Okay. A lot of people think it's where rocks and evolution came to be. I still remember being on very top, on the top of this mountain and finding sedimentary rocks. We had found um, little brachiopods, which are small shells inside these rocks, 7,000 feet up in the air. And I asked the, the person that was leading the guide that was telling us, and she was giving us a bunch of facts that I didn't believe in. But I just asked the question, I said, how did we get these shells 7,000 feet up in the air? And she was trying to describe there was, there was uplifting and moving things and moving plates back and all that. And I said, don't you believe it could have been a flood? She said, no way. Just that way. So it kind of makes me think. Okay. The Grand Canyon dimensions are 216 miles, 216 miles long. Its width is four, uh, four to 18 miles in width uh, and is about one mile deep. You with me? Okay. The canyon represents 80 cubic miles of excavation project. In other words, we're missing 80 cubic miles of earth. My question is, where did all the rock and dirt go? It's not there. So we think it's catastrophic from the beginning, that it probably, because of the catastrophic flood, that moved the waters all over the place, moved that all over the place, which we see evidence of. Now, let's talk about this. The Grand Canyon re uh, records geological strata from about 300 million years of evolutionary time during the Paleozoic era. So that means 300 million years of time have been in that canyon. You follow me? 300 million years of time. That's what the evolutionists tell us. So we have history here. Okay. So is it complete? The Paleozoic time frame only represents five out of the eight of the, uh, five out of seven periods of evolutionary time. So the Ordovician, 46 million years, and Silurian periods, 24.6 million years, are completely missing. So if you add those up, we are what? We're about 70 million, pretty close to it, missing out of 300 million. Okay, let's go a little further. We see that as we look at the canyon, we see that small parts of the periods are represented. In other words, it's not continuous. It, there's just small parts of these different periods, okay? So you would have a bit over here in the Cameron, a bit over here. Small parts of these periods are represented in the Grand Canyon, re resulting in a representation of 10% of the complete geological record. So when somebody says to you, hey, that whole canyon represents you know, millions of years, well, right now it's only 10% complete. Let's go a little further. Geological record so incomplete that it only represents brief intervals of time, which can be interrupted of brief episodes of Genesis flood and depositions. So we look and see piece by piece by piece by piece. And that's what we see. I'm going to go a little further with you because this is kind of neat. You know, we've been to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, my wife and I. I, we, I know we walked on this, it's been some time ago, but that, see that bottom where my pointer is pointing, that is the bottom. That is when I told you about the ground, the base rock. Well, that's the new schist, which is metamorphic, and it sits right there. Now take a look on top. You see this top here? These are sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks were driven by, by water, we believe. Sedimentary rocks mean sediments, and those rocks are made by sediments, sandstone, mudstone, sediments, sediments, sand, sand is a mud. You have, um, you have different varieties of sedimentary rock. I mentioned there could be like limestone, and that's, that means we have shells all meshed up and all that kind of stuff. So the peace sandstone is a layer just above the new basement rocks, identified with an evolutionary dates of 550 to two 520 million years old. So let me point those out to you. They're right in here. You see it? It's a beet sandstone's right in here. And, and the sandstone is very beautiful, by the way. It's made of sand. 
is rocks. You can see sandstone with layers of beautiful rocks. If you go around Arizona and so on, like sometimes they call it the painted desert. When you look at those beautiful rocks, different colors, usually red. Red is iron. Red, that's what red means. Okay. These rocks are made of sand, sand sediment, solidified with specific, specific conditions, including evaporation of watery matrix, watery matrix, and the hardening of minerals. So how do I make cement? I take water, right? I take my mint and I let the, what happens? The water evaporates and hardens up. We believe the same thing happened. Everybody, evolutionists, creations believe the same thing. See, because we see it with our very eyes. You can take carbonates or carbon uh, carbon oxide. You could take um, silicon dioxide, silicon oxide. Those kind of work as cements and they cement rocks. And by being around and being, you know, when you have this kind of chaotic mess of rocks rubbing rocks, you're going to get that. And so you're going to get this powder. This powder can turn into cement and these cement make the sedimentary rocks. We teach this in geology. The fundamental sedimentary layer extends from Arizona into New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, then in associates with the northern states of Wyoming, Montana, Illinois, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and on then onto Canada. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that these rocks right in here, see, those, those rocks are, are caused by the flood, sandstone. The sandstone is touching this layer here, okay? And this layer here is very old. This layer here is old, but not this old. So we got two rock layers touching each other. And there is what we call unconformity. Remember I told you about 65 million years of unconformity? What if I told you there was a billion years here? A billion years. What happened to the billions of years? Well, let's take a look. As we look at this, we see that uh, it is so immense I'm talking about the peat land uh, sandstones on the bottom, extending on our continent, okay, bottom layer, and they're extending on our continent. And as you look and you see, um, the, the, there, there's, there's the bottom layer, Vishnu schist or metamorphic rock, okay, million, dated billions of years right in here. Then you look at this and it's dated 520 million years. So you've got a big difference in time. The mechanism to lay down coarse sand sediments can only be only be scientifically explained by high velocity currents driven by water in a single catastrophic event. Did you hear what I just said? It's hard to define it any other way. Next point. Because million uh, because a billion plus years are missing. Now, did you hear what I just said? I went through Pennsylvania. I went to Canada. Okay. I'm at the Grand Canyon and I'm telling you, see this layer here? Okay, that extends, all, you know, transfers through the globe and not, not all the way around, but a good portion of it, okay? Above it, okay, in the United States and extended into Atlantic is the Tapit sandstones. That layer sits on top of that layer. And there's a million, a, sorry, did I say million? A billion years missing. I repeat. A billion years missing. Now they say that's erosion. I say that's a proof of a worldwide flood. The peat sandstone is sand. Sand is the first layer we believe that would settle down during a worldwide flood. So here we go. Creation week is down here. These flood rocks strata above here. That's how we look at the Grand Canyon with lots of layers missing. So I did this. I took this picture that's in many textbooks of the great unconformity. Everybody agrees this is a million years missing. They said, well, it's because of, you know, the idea of rocks flowing over these things and, and, and moving it and, and eroding it. And, but I'm coming to you and saying that this is a God thing. This is where God creates the rocks. And then we have a catastrophe of worldwide flood. There is a million, a billion years missing where the basement rocks, which are composed of metamorphic rock called schist and granites, touch the Tapit sandstone. So this right in here, granites are from, by the way, a volcano or underneath. Um, they don't actually, they're similar to uh, volcanic rocks because they are made from magma uh, and they sit hard underneath the ground. So here we are. The Vishnu, there, there's pressure rocks underneath here. 
And then you have this, there's a Tapete, that Tapete land, uh, sandstone is right on top. It's called the Toronto Group. So I just did this. I put a line right through it so you can see it. That line represents 1 billion plus years missing. Okay? So when you think of rock layers being continuous, you have to look at that. And you can see right in front of you where the great unconformity lines up and the Tapete sandstones right go on top of it. Every time you see that, that's, to me, proof of creation. What else do I have? I have this. I have the scripture. When I think of the scripture, I'm aware of this. Knowing the first, that there shall come in the last days. We're talking about the last days. Scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is this promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. Doesn't it sound like uniformitarianism? Just continuous. It's going to be continuous. Evolution is continuous. Everything's continuous. Okay, just from the beginning of the creation. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. And saying, where is the promise coming from? For since the fathers fell asleep, in other words, the teaching wasn't done. All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this, they willing are they willingly are ignorant of that by word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water. We believe that when creation was came, you see in Genesis 1, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, water is mentioned in Genesis 2. Genesis 1, God, what God and God said, God and God created the heavens and the earth, right? That's Genesis 1. Genesis 2, it says that the earth was what unformed, void, but there was water. There was water, and the, the spirit was hovering over it. So we see that there out of water and by water, there was water. Uh, I believe that during that time, that's when God started with this powerful um, Holy Spirit, energized the whole universe. We started to get the energies. And then the next verse said, God said, let there be light and it was light. Now it says here, oh, we're being overflowed with water and they perished. So the world then was being overflowed. Now we talk about the water being created by, and then what do we, whereby the world that was out of water and in water, whereby the world then that was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, preserved into fire, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly man. The day of God's judgment is going to come. The day of tribulation will be here and God's judgment will be there. So we know that. So that kind of reminds me of sometimes, when, I mean, when people talk about these millions and millions of years, reminds me that, hey, this is kind of what I hear all the time. This, this idea of evolution, this idea of long periods of time is really an idol. It's false teaching. It takes us away from who we belong to, Jesus Christ, our God. So now the third myth I'm going to get into. And the third myth gets a little complicated because I'm going to talk about radiometric dating. So here we go. Take a deep breath. This is the first. So as we review the second key, we're going to hang our key on. We talked about bias. Now we talked about the rock layers not being continuous. We just saw an example where we found a billion years missing. What happened to it? And there's other missing layers. There's not one continuous layer whatsoever around the world. So we have a poor record of rocks being continuous. Actually, just the opposite, they're not continuous. We believe that's caused by the worldwide flood. All right, so now they talk about radiometric dating depends on evolutionary presuppositions. You follow me? Now, I'm gonna get into radiometric dating. I've taught this for many, many years. I'm gonna to try to simplify it as best as I can, okay? For those online, and for the, now those, maybe those online have some degree of, uh, of science and modern physics and all that, but I, I don't have time to get into all the details. I'm just going to try to discuss it like I'm simply teaching, you know, everybody, and I'm going to just keep it simple, okay? 
You say, keep it simple, stupid. I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm the stupid one. I'm going to try to keep it simple. Okay. So we have electrons, we have protons, and we have neutrons. Right, right away, I lost people. That's in the atom. Okay. So atoms are invisible. Atoms make up the whole world. Atoms are everywhere. In that little atom, there's a nucleus. And that's where things go crazy. Also on the outside, there's an electron coming in, and that happens. So we have this thing, even in the atom, it's not as stable as we might think it is. The atom that makes everything up can be unstable. Do you, do you understand that? It can be unstable. There are certain atoms that are unstable, like there are certain people who are unstable, OK? So I, just to make you know comparisons, OK? And so what happens is that when they become unstable, things happen inside the nucleus. They discharge things uh, and so on. Now, uh, we call that kind of thing, we call that thing radioactivity. Many atoms that make up the elements are stable, but there are some that spontaneously change into new atoms by emitting high uh, energetic radiation. So everybody, when we had the microwave saying, I'm getting radiated, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about going through something that's radioactive that when you go near it, you can get really sick, okay? Because the energy from that is so powerful that it goes through your skin, goes into your blood, can get into your atoms and change your atoms around. That that's dangerous. You say, that gets real dangerous. You know, when we have mutations, that's, that also has to do with um, chemistry but it's not getting into this part. This part is the nucleus and radioactivity can get into the atom and make funny things happen. So we also know that when things come out of the atom, there's energy released. So when something comes out of the atom, you ready for this? Zoom, radioactive energy comes out. Strong energy, okay? Very strong energy, all right? You know about nuclear bombs. Everybody's scared about that. That's what I'm talking about, that kind of nuclear energy, all right? Now, of course, there are some atoms that are not as energetic as others. So they, they, we do it by what we call half-life. If something is very energetic, it has a low half-life. I work with something in a lab called iodine, iodine isotope. And in a little bit, it just disappeared. Okay, we had to be very careful when we handle it. Same thing with a lot of these things. So let's take a look. What have they dated? I'm just going to show you moon rocks. Take a look at disparity at these dates. So whenever, this is the first thing I'm going to show you. Whenever something is radiometric dated, you're going to have disparity. I don't care where, what, you never get the exact thing. It's kind of a guessing game, which one is best. Okay, you with me so far? All right, those online, okay. So you could see different dates, okay? You notice um, there's a sample number, uh, 3.6 uranium thorium lead, that's the method they use. And they have 3.6, 4.79. So we have a potassium argon is 2.2. So we have these inconsistencies of 2.59 billion years. Now, there are things like that that happen. They have to pick the best states. We're going to get to something more substantial. That's carbon dating. Carbon dating is like radiometric dating, but it's a little different. What's different with it? Well, Again, it deals with the atom, it deals with unstable atoms. The sun, we know that the sun has a lot of energy and the energy from the sun can be dangerous. We can get skin cancer from the high uh, ultraviolet rays from the sun. Okay, we know that. So we have to guard ourselves from the sun. Imagine if you start coming closer to the sun, like our atmosphere in the outer end, it's really close to the sun. And so what happens is that energy from the sun i'm just explaining it we call it has neutrons and that's just part of the atom hits a nitrogen uh atom that's floating on top because we have a lot of nitrogen in our atmosphere and what happens that becomes excited and we get a carbon 14 from that so how do we get carbon 14 we get it because the sun energy hits a nitrogen atom and changes it not teaching you chemistry. I'm not teaching you nuclear chemistry. I'm just trying to keep it simple out here and on the line. Okay. So now we have carbon 14. Now you might have heard of carbon dating. Now, how old is this bone or how old is this piece of cloth? The Shirin uh, uh, Torin, I'm sorry, Torin's um, cloth shroud. I'm sorry, Shirin, thank you. Uh, 
the Shroud of Turin, their cloth, they dated the cloth with, with radiometric date, date, I mean, with carbon dating. This is the kind of dating they used, okay? So we want to keep you, because cloth is basically made of organic things, you follow me? Cotton, whatever fabric they use, uh, contains carbon. So they can date it by using how much carbon-14 was in it. Okay, let's take a look at another one. This is another little diagram. Let's see. Oh, by the way, let me go back here. Uh, so the carbon-14, what happens? It comes down, it's heavy, it comes down on Earth. And what happens? It's absorbed by the tree. You see that? So the carbon-14 goes to the tree, vegetation. Cows eat the vegetation, and they carry carbon-14. You eat the meat, and what happens? You become carbon-14. So everybody has carbon-14 in them to some degree. Okay, it's not going to kill you. It's not going to cause cancer. Don't worry about it. It's just where we are. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind. So this is kind of what we call in cycling. Here's another one. Plants and animals die. They stop taking carbon-14 in. Now, if you die, what happens? You can't take carbon. You can't eat carbon-14. You can't breathe it in. So you no more carbon-14 goes into your system. So we measure the, how much carbon-14 you have. All right, does that make sense? How much carbon-14 you have? That's how we do it. Now let's go to the next one. So when we look at this, we say, okay, if you have a lot of carbon-14, you're gonna be a certain age too because we compare it to your normal carbon in your body. So we develop a ratio. Carbon-14 is radioactive and decays into nitrogen. Carbon-14 is natural, carbon-12 is natural. So we make uh, this comparison, how much carbon-14 to carbon-12 you have. Now, if the ratio is high, your specimen is young, because if you have a lot of carbon-14, that means that you're not very old. If you have very little carbon-14, you're old. Now, I'm not talking about age in this room or over the line. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about thousands of years, okay? Uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years, okay? Not millions. The state's thousands of years. So the, it's how much carbon-14 and carbon-12 you have. The older you get, the less carbon-14 you have. Scientists can use the ratio to help determine the starting amount of carbon-14. The amount of carbon-12 will remain constant, but the amount of carbon-14 will remain, become less and less as time goes on. In other words, you're never going to get more carbon-14 unless you're around something that up in the air somewhere, living up there near the stratosphere, getting the carbon-14. That's not going to happen. You're here. You're going to live on Earth, and you're going to, the older, you, and I'm talking about when specimens die, no more carbon-14 is brought in, they start releasing it. Now, some of you are thinking, wait a minute. I mean, when I get buried, the carbon-14, yeah, I'm talking about burial, because that's where we find fossils. We, we find them buried. We find them everywhere. So some of you might be questioning conditions of this. They say that these radiometric dates or the carbon dates are pretty steady because they don't get involved in the environment. Well, I'm going to discuss that in a moment. That could be a problem. Anything over car about 50,000 years old should theoretically have no detectable carbon-14 left. That was uh, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago. They say you can go to 100,000 years. I don't know. Becomes, here's the thing. Carbon-14 seems to work in ranges of thousands, like 5,000, 4,000. It seems to work. It doesn't work every time because as you can see there's a lot of problems. I mean, carbon-14 could go out, uh, can come out. You can have maybe a wash. They say that things don't interrupt, but you can, you can, the outside has influences and it can change the carbon four. Now we have supposedly a lot of carbon 12 in the air because we're killing ourselves with global warming. That's going to change the amount of carbon 12. You follow? It gets crazy. So it gets down to guessing. And that's what I want to show you. Uh, this ratio turns out to be uh, about one carbon 14 atom for every 1 trillion carbon 12 atoms, which is amazing how small. So I'll show you this accelerated mass spectrometer. And this is an amazing instrument because you can measure real fine particles inside that thing. Okay. And that's how they determine it. Okay. So here's some questions. See this? How much carbon 14 did that animal originally have? Nobody knows. Carbon 12, carbon 14. What, what did it really have? Nobody knows. That's the problem with carbon 14 dating. How about this? We found both coal and diamonds have products called carbon 14 dates. 
only thousands of years despite conventional age assignments of millions of years. I'll go even further. We dated on our site, I mean, on the site that we actually dug up dinosaurs, they dated the, di the dinosaurs, they're supposed to be 65 million years old to 20,000 years. Now there was, of course, there's something wrong. I mean, I don't believe in the dating method, but we have found as creationists, we can find carbon-14 everywhere. You follow me? Now, if they find carbon-14, it only dates thousands of years. So you find carbon-14, it kind of is an enigma. It is a problem for evolutionists. And if you find it in diamond, that means the theory really stinks because diamonds are supposedly not measured millions, millions and millions of years. That's a problem. Okay, are you with me? So carbon-14 is reliable in small amounts, but don't go to the bank with it because we have problems with it, so. Okay, next one. Nuclear force, the strongest magnetic force. So we take a look at this and we see that the strongest magnetic force, you can see that what happens is when nuclear energy takes place, it lets out tremendous amount of energy. I, I went over that and that's Einstein's equation. So um, when you, uranium-235, this is how explosion, how an atomic bomb really works. You take uranium-235, you hit it, and all of a sudden, look what happens. It splits up into two, breaks up, and boom, these particles come out, okay? They call them neutrons, they're released, and lots of energy. See, whenever you have a breakup in the nucleus, lots of energy is released, okay? They found out by using the periodic table, this table of elements, they found out which ones will break. I'm going through this quickly. I'm, this is not a class in this. Just show you that there are elements that tend to be unstable and can be measured to some degree, okay? So here is the parent isotope. You see it? The starting quantity of the mass radioactive that's decaying. See it going through the, this makes it simple. You see the hourglass? That hourglass is representing how much you had in the beginning and how much you're gonna have as it decays. You stop it, that's how old it is. You can measure by this time blast. You can measure how much you have here, how much you have here, and then you can figure out the time. Now they, of course, they did this with the time, the, the sand timer, and you could do it. How much time do I have? Sometimes you wait till the end and you know it's time. Um, so the parent isotope is the one, the starting amount, the top part, okay? And that's, and so you see it decaying, okay? The daughter is the bottom part. We call that the daughter. The daughter is the how much you how much you went through and how much you have now left because the atom changed. It changed from its original radioactive form to its natural form. So it's got to go through that transition. So you can measure how much parent you have and how much daughter you have. All right. So um, let's go away. All right. Okay. Again, we use an accelerator to measure that kind of, we can measure how many particles, and it goes into very tiny particles. So I do agree that these measure very well, okay? Now, if the sand is on top, the daughter is on the bottom, we see the rate can be measured how fast the sand is falling. Now, they believe the sand is always falling at the same time. They don't believe that ever that ever changes. They believe that sand dial starts and that never changes. Radio isotope dating means if we date, we get one that's parent. And when it goes down to a half, we measure it and we can figure out the time it took go from a parent to half its size, the daughter, and we can measure it. And they give it to us in decay rates and half-lives and so on. Nothing important for you, it's just a measure of speed. That's all you need to know. So we can figure out its rate, how fast it goes. Now there's basic assumptions made, you ready? These are never told to you. They said, I dated this thing, I did that. I got this all figured out. First thing I'd ask you, did you know how much you started off with? Let's get that thing up, there it is. See it? Did you start off with that amount? How do you know what you, did you start off with nothing? How did you, you had to start off with something. Okay, I, I agree, you have to, if you're gonna go down there, change it. But how much did you start? Nobody knows, nobody knows, okay? Um, Adam and Eve were created what? As infants? As babies? Hmm? How about the trees in the garden? Were they little things? No, everything was formed. They had to live. Same thing here. 
So we assume that there had to be appearance of age. Evolutionists don't know that. They think there's that we have all parent and no daughter. The rate of flow of the sand never changes. They've done studies and come to the conclusion that that rate can change. Creatures have done that and realize that rate could change. In other words, that could expand or deplete. You can put pressure on one side, cause it to move a little faster. Uh, we've seen this. Assumption two, there is no mixing. In other words, you assume that nothing is coming into the container. Now I had this thing set up in my, my backyard. My wife's going to photograph me. I had this beautiful container that, you know, you put lemonade in and has a, a little nozzle and you push it down. And I was going to push it down and keep it the same rate and all that, but I, I couldn't get the camera anyway. I just, <laughs> but you can do this. I mean, it's not hard. You can come in and somebody can, as you're pouring, somebody can come in and add more to it. You follow me? They can come right in and add more to it. How do you know that it has more to it? Or what if somebody slipped the bottom out? Somebody took the bottom out and said, okay, I'm going to take this and drink it. You, you know, we start from the zero. Nobody knows. There's mixing going on. And, and, and creations have found that happening, taking place. Also, so no mixing. So there's uranium turning into lead. And so we're assuming that uranium, and that's the way it really happens, uranium turns to lead. So here's uranium, here's lead. What's happening is we're being influenced more radium and they just assume that we have a closed system, but that system is assumed to be closed and that we have a problem with. How do you know it's closed? Especially have a universal worldwide flood. What if God's created everything and the sedimentary rocks started to flow? I believe that some of the sedimentary rocks were there in the beginning. We didn't have all, uh, it was just not all flood. Most of them we think were caused by flood. There's no known amount of original substance. Sand is on top, it's not known. So, bottom line, radiometric data, okay, but the key on it, is made of assumptions. It sounds fancy, we use fancy machines, but we have basically a lot of assumptions thrown in that dating method. Always starting substance. How much do we have? Number two, uh, is it being interfered with? Is something in the, in, the, in the environment being interfered with? And three, is it constant? Is it going all the time? We had a worldwide flood and that worldwide flood would change anything. And we can see that. Of course, they'll measure it. They'll tell us to exactly what it's about. But the assumption is this. You ready for this? This is the big assumption. Because I've been going to school and they told me the earth is millions of years old. Everything is based on that. And if you know the earth is billions of years old, then you're going to assume it that way. A lot of the dating systems are made that way. But what? The assumption that the earth is old. If you start off with that bias, that's a big bias. Everything goes wrong. So to sum up, summarize, thank you for your attention. This was kind of hard one. God's word can be trusted. Not man's word, not man's science, although I love science. Uh, science is great. I like operational science, science that I can put my hands on, we can repeat. And so on. a lot of this stuff that we talked about can never be repeated. Uh, the sum of your words is truth and every one of your righteous ordinance is everything. Psalm 119, 160. Some of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. It'll never, God's word will always stay. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. God's word is truth. And lastly, 2 Timothy 3 16. All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. God's word will always stay. We use it to to um, become better in ourselves because God's breathed that word as used for our teaching so we get more mature in Christ. It's for our reproof so we can see where we're going wrong. It's for our correction as we, are, we, we confess our sins to the Lord, we keep moving and for training in righteousness. It's for our training, for our purpose. God's word is everything. I leave you with that. I'll end up with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that as we look at this earth, the Bible speaks very clearly of what happened. We believe in the biblical history of the world. And the Bible speaks clearly of that history. We go by it. 
We know it's true. It makes perfectly good sense. In your precious and unbelievable name, we pray. Amen.